spring 2021. 100,000 Russian troops mass along the border with Ukraine. The military buildup is the largest ever in the years-long conflict between the two countries. It's a battle fought between Ukraine's armed forces and Russia-backed separatists using Russian weapons who control the Donbas region in the country's east. Since 2014, 14,000 people have been killed, infrastructure and livelihoods destroyed. It's Europe's forgotten war. In April 2021, President Vladimir Putin turns up the heat. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky looks to the West for support. Germany and France seek to mediate. Countries in Eastern Europe are alarmed. The EU is torn between those who favor diplomacy and those who argue Putin has little interest in talking. At the European or EU level, there is still no real, well-thought-out strategy on how to deal with Russia. There is concern, too, that Putin's meddling in Ukraine is all about asserting Russian influence and undermining the unity of the West. For Vladimir Putin, everything is geopolitical and geoeconomic. He has no respect for anyone. Ukraine once a part of the Soviet Union, remains vulnerable to Putin's revanchist ambitions. We have to expect President Putin to not keep his word, not to play by the rules, and to be willing to use military force. But we must remember another phrase of Putin. Putin once said that if a fight is inevitable, he must strike first. You have to remember that too. What's at stake reaches far beyond the country's borders. Russia's action in Ukraine has triggered nothing less than a new Cold War, one that Europe appears powerless to stop. In this film, we talk to people on the street, international experts and the president of Ukraine to discover why the country's war should serve as a wake-up call for all Europeans. I think it will. It could possibly be World War III. And then Europe, our neighbors, the countries of the European Union, they will all suffer as a result. Thirty years since Ukraine gained independence from the Soviet Union, the country is caught in a conflict with Putin's Russia. Kiev wants to end the war. It accuses Moscow of fomenting unrest in Ukrainian sovereign territory. They are actually leading the fighting in Ukraine. But nonetheless, it's hard to get to a point where you are talking about constructive actions to end the conflict if Russia is, in fact, denying that it's doing it. Europe's big hitters, Germany and France, stand by Ukraine, but not at any cost. Some people want to do business with Russia. The parliamentary group is very strong in Germany. The East Committee of the German economy is on the move massively. There is something else to add. There is a very large sounding board, a feeling of closeness to Russia in large parts of the German population, and more so than with the US.
Putin wants to reassert Russia's position as a global superpower. He appears determined to expand Russia's sphere of influence. If, let's say, Russia swallows Ukraine, it makes it a different Russia. And this is, this is the Russian calculus. It needs to control covertly or overtly Ukraine in order to expose and project also European influence. Russian military maneuvers on the border with Ukraine in spring 2021 raise concerns Putin is indeed planning an attack. Kharkiv, in the east of Ukraine, lies just 40 kilometers from the Russian border. People fear the city is in the line of fire. Когда я сначала услышал это, мне стало довольно страшно, потому что, насколько я знаю, они установили ракетную установку, которая стреляет по машинам на 270 километров от до Харькова, извините, от Белгорода сколько? 45, если не ошибаюсь. И если мы получим удар, то, ну, это все, это конец. Ну, очень страшно, что это все дойдет до нас и что придется принимать какие-то такие меры, как переезд и все такое, потому что Никто не знает, как это все дальше будет развиваться. But Ukraine is a country torn between Western Europe and Russia. And Kharkiv embodies a corresponding division within Ukrainian society. Here, ties with Russia, including family ties, remain strong. People may not support Putin, but they are not all anti-Russia. Извините, как может быть Россия нам враг, когда это родные нам люди, это родные наши люди. Мы с одинаковым менталитетом, у нас корни одинаковые, у нас история одна и та же. Я, я думаю, что если пока есть Путин, не будет ни войны, не будет ни военных действий, и, и будет все благополучно, понимаете? Вот пока есть Путин в России. Почему-то мы так... Это не только мое мнение, это мнение моих, моих знакомых тоже. Putin claims the military action along the border is in response to provocations by NATO. He issues a warning too. Организаторы любых провокаций, угрожающих коренным интересам нашей безопасности, пожалеют о содеянном так, как давно уже ни о чем не жалели. Но надеюсь, что никому не придет в голову перейти в отношении России так называемую красную черту. А где она будет проходить, это мы будем определять в каждом конкретном случае сами. Ukraine's President Zelensky addresses Putin directly. He wants to discuss the conflict. Господин Путин, я готов пойти еще дальше и предложить вам встретиться в любой точке украинского Донбасса, где идет война. Slava Ukraine. The Russian declines the Ukrainian's request. He says Zelensky should discuss the conflict with the separatists in eastern Ukraine, not Moscow. In effect, denying Russia is involved in the war. Why then is he flexing his military muscle on the border with Ukraine? We are close. We are neighbors. This is geography. This is our history and life, but I can probably tell why this is happening. First of all, it was to test the strength of the new administration, of the President of the United States, and see his reaction. In mid-April, President Joe Biden reaches out to the Russian leader and invites him to a summit. Biden wants to talk face to face to dial down the bellicose mood music from Russia. Putin's saber-rattling has worked. He's got his reward, Biden's attention. I think Vladimir Putin does deserve credit for being one of the most uh, strategic-minded and patient uh, leaders uh, in Europe right now. He, he knows what he wants to do. He's patient about it. He does it and he exploits weaknesses, exploits division, exploits opportunities as they arise. 
Now Putin can announce the completion of maneuvers and a troop withdrawal. The immediate danger is averted, but Ukrainian forces remain on alert. Observers say Russian military hardware remains in place. In Kiev, tensions still run high. Russia aggressor, and this must be lunate from each corner of the room, from each microphone. Everyone must know. Such a feeling that the world is led by the elite, especially in such a fragile phase of the development of hormones in the organism. Such a nightmare. Ukraine's President Zelensky has been under intense pressure from the moment he took office. Two years into the job, Zelensky has put on a show to promote his political brand. He wants to project the image of a powerful leader. We are invited to witness the event. And you know, the question is not only to build a dream of peace, but to build a dream of peace. Говорив би про це, побудувати дійсно країну мрій. Zelensky has also agreed to give an interview for this film. He needs the West to understand that war in Ukraine threatens the very security of Europe. Zelensky, however, is no ordinary president. Prior to his election, Zelensky's only experience of politics is fictional. As a young man in the late 1990s, the Russian-speaking Zelensky studied law in his home city of Kriviri in southern Ukraine. I did not dream of becoming a lawyer. I did not dream of becoming a serious prosecutor. No, I didn't want all that. I wanted to remain a student. So, in parallel, we set up a small theatre, more of a comedy theatre a small comedy theater. Zelensky leaves law behind at the college exit. Comedy becomes his profession. Fast forward to 2014, and Zelensky is busy at work on a new TV comedy drama, Servant of the People, in which he plays a history teacher who becomes president on a ticket to tackle corruption. Released in 2015 on Ukrainian TV channel OnePlus One, the first series is a massive hit. Ukrainian audiences laugh in recognition as the show lampoons Ukraine's corrupt brand of politics, where oligarchs hold sway and money talks. In 2015, this theme is especially relevant, as just a year before, the country's then-president Viktor Yanukovych is forced from office, and the level of his wealth and dishonesty is exposed. <laughs> the palace Yanukovych had built for himself becomes the set for the official residence of Zelensky's fictional president. Yeah, it's just a big wooden house and it's weird and bizarre, but it's not surprising in terms of uh, how lavish it is and how expensive it is because, well, I think everybody pretty much knew what, I mean, how, how much money is being stolen and how 
uh, how it is used. The real life story that led to Yanukovych's departure is far from funny. It set in motion the events that altered Ukraine's relationship with Putin's Russia, from one of relative harmony to hostility. In November 2013, President Yanukovych suspends signing a trade deal and association agreement with the European Union. I told him directly and openly, Viktor Fedorovich, you are making a big mistake. He replied that the Ukrainian government, after analyzing the pros and cons of such a course, had come to the conclusion that it was premature for us, premature for Ukraine to take a real course towards Europe, and that we should remain in the orbit of the Soviet-Russian system. Not Soviet, but Russian system. In Kiev, pro-West Ukrainians pour onto the streets in protest. They want Yanukovych to either sign the agreement with the EU or leave office. Ukraine was in 2014. When we look at the people who went to these protests, these people were no longer divided between East and West. But the majority of them came, of course, from the very nationally oriented West, or let's not say the majority, a large proportion. Putin had already pledged financial assistance to Ukraine, but he failed to deliver. Tensions persist. Demonstrations continue into 2014. Between the 18th and 20th of February, security forces attack protesters gathered on Maidan Square in central Kiev. Over 100 people are killed. Parliament votes to impeach the president. Yanukovych is forced to flee the country. His destination? Russia. Vladimir Putin had not anticipated this scenario at all. He was convinced that he could keep Yanukovych in power, and he regularly told Yanukovych that he had to repress more strongly. Not all Ukrainians support the protesters. Putin exploits pro-Russian sentiment in the southeast and in March 2014 illegally annexes Crimea, calling it an exit. The annexation of the strategic Black Sea Peninsula quickly followed Sunday's hastily called referendum in which its residents overwhelmingly backed breaking from Ukraine and joining Russia. Many in Ukraine fear exactly that, that Putin will go further. The Western Alliance, meanwhile, has been played. And there we found ourselves, in a completely new situation where the Russian head of state had basically made choices for the great country of Ukraine and had tried at all costs to keep a president in place. He had immediately proceeded not only to annex Crimea, 
but then to absorb the whole province of Crimea and also the city of Sevastopol, which has a special status, and to make them two subjects of the Russian Federation. In response to Crimea's annexation, members of the G7 impose harsh sanctions against Putin and Russia. Clearly, it was not expected that the West would react so unitedly and so decisively. I was often asked in Russia, why you of all people? You should understand that we feel humiliated. You yourselves were humiliated after the First World War. But this is not a good historical comparison. The historical comparison is that it is precisely a country that has had such a difficult history as Germany that must stand up resolutely for upholding the law. And that's why the clear message that had to be sent was, a red line has been reached here. In April 2014, tensions increase as fighting breaks out in the industrial and mostly Russian-speaking Donbas region in southeast Ukraine between Russia-backed separatists and government forces. Putin is accused of fueling the unrest. To say that I was very surprised would be an exaggeration, because I knew one thing from talking often to Yeltsin, listening to Putin, and talking to many Russian officials. They kept saying, repeating to me, Ukraine has been, is, and will be in Russia's strategic interests. This meant that Russia would never agree to Ukraine taking a Western position or choosing to follow a civilized Western democratic course. The conflict quickly escalates. Within the first few months, hundreds of Ukrainian servicemen and volunteers are killed. There's evidence that Russian weaponry has been supplied to the separatists. And some Russian soldiers are fighting alongside the rebels. On August 29th, the death toll is close to 400, the highest number on any one day to date. This man's 26-year-old brother, Dimitro, is among them. Many are trying to leave Donbass. My город наполовину разрушен. Макеевка реально на треть разрушена. Школа, в которой я проучилась 9 лет, она разрушена наполовину. Весь квартал родной, в котором я выросла, то есть, ну, как бы там простреленные дома, разрушенные, как бы. И это Макеевка, где в принципе особо не было боевых действий. 
The impact of the conflict reaches beyond Ukraine's borders. In July 2014, passenger flight MH17, en route from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, is shot down over separatist-held Donbass. All 298 people on board died. Evidence emerges the plane was hit by a ground-launched missile fired by a unit of the Russian Air Defense Brigade. It's Russia's covert war on European soil, killing EU citizens. Two months earlier, before the war escalates, oligarch and former government minister Petro Poroshenko is elected president on a pro-European, anti-corruption ticket. He's also pledged to return Crimea to Ukraine and end the conflict in the Donbas. France and Germany initiate talks between Ukraine and Russia. In February 2015 in Belarus, the party signed the so-called Minsk II agreement. It seeks to re-establish Ukraine's control over its border with Russia, but only after elections have been held in the disputed territory. It also requires a change in the Ukrainian constitution, which grants special status for occupied Donbass. Russia is not named as a party to the war, despite evidence to the contrary. In his memoirs, French President Hollande described how the Russian president had raised his voice in the negotiations and had threatened the Ukrainian president, saying that he would destroy the Ukrainian forces, which of course is the best evidence that Russia was very active there. And these protocols, as they're also called, were signed literally under the gunshot because uh, Russians uh, they verbally threatened uh, military um, operation in the Baltsevo, uh, which they actually then executed. In retrospect, you could say it should have looked a lot different. There, Russia should have been portrayed as the warring party and Ukraine should have been allowed to make other demands. Set against President Putin, Poroshenko looks weak. His attempts to bring peace fail. And his pro-reform agenda is also called into question. Our assessment is that he um, did the things that he had to do that were the result of joint pressure from the civil society and from the international community. I don't think he was ever serious about um, really making, uh, changing the system and, and, and enacting the the anti-corruption infrastructure, so that becomes a threat to him and his allies. That's, that's the thing. In 2018, the race for the next president is opened. Poroshenko is seeking re-election. His main challenger is political outsider Volodymyr Zelensky the man famous for playing the part of a fictional president. A second series of his ratings winner, Servant of the People, is screened in 2017. And you also see in these series that the political power constellation portrayed in the film, in the fiction, has many parallels to reality. In brackets, Timoshenko, Poroshenko, who are not called that, but there are indications that this is who is meant. Then the production company, Quartal 95, goes a step further. In March 2018, it registers Servant of the People as a political party. On New Year's Eve, its presidential nominee is revealed. Dear 
з новим роком, з новим слугою народу. Almost immediately, Zelensky is the top candidate in the presidential race. It was kind of a blank sheet of papers that everybody filled uh, with, with their, you know, hopes and dreams and, 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 and everything. Unlike Zelensky's fictional president, whose election campaign is crowdfunded, the servant of the People Party is bankrolled by the owner of TV channel One Plus One, media tycoon and oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky. He has his own reasons for wanting to oust Petro Poroshenko. Kolomoisky says he was robbed of billions of dollars by Poroshenko when a bank he co-owned was nationalized. A Zelensky presidency might work to his advantage. On the 19th of April, two nights before the election, President Poroshenko and Volodymyr Zelensky trade blows in a public debate held in Kiev's Olympic Stadium. Zelensky, the actor, is playing to the crowd. Ми маємо захистити державу від вас. Ви є головний провідник олігархів і точно одного олігарха в тікача. On April 21st, Zelensky wins the election with an outright majority. He's taken over 73% of the vote compared to Poroshenko's 24%. Zelensky was never a politician, and he is still not. But it worked because he was very much supported by several very powerful oligarchs in the media who financed his campaign and devoted the media to Zelensky's anti-Poroshenko candidacy. It's an irony that Zelensky is elected thanks to the oligarch's backing. Yet it's his ordinary man, anti-corruption persona, that appeals to voters. Я голосовал за Зеленского. Вот. Мы хотели, чтобы не было Порошенко. Мы не хотели того, что было. Я ожидал увидеть Зеленского, по крайней мере, хоть и не убежденного, но либерала, человека, для которого права и свободы граждан что-то значат. Зробили це. Moscow is unprepared. Putin is a Soviet man after all, and so is the rest of the Russian leadership. And for these people, such free and open elections in general are more than a little strange. In his inaugural address, President Zelensky says his first task is to bring peace to the Donbas and end the war with Russia. He travels first to Brussels. He's playing the statesman, hoping to impress his hosts. The strategic course of Ukraine to achieve full-fledged membership in the EU and NATO, which is secured in the constitution of Ukraine, remains unchanged. 
NATO is faced with a dilemma. If Ukraine is granted membership now, the alliance could find itself at war with Russia. I'm eager to give new impetus to our engagement with the alliance. The ongoing armed Russian aggression remains a major challenge for Euro-Atlantic security. It is very important. It's what the Ukrainian people have chosen. And we want to be in the alliance. We want to start the membership action plan. Now imagine Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. That's what they are striving for. That means NATO shows up on Russia's southwest border. In this case, and what happened with Crimea is of course a defensive reaction from Russia, a kind of warning. Look, we, Russia, will not tolerate Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. After his trip to Brussels, Zelensky then reaches out to President Putin. He sends him a message via Facebook. In late July, a ceasefire, together with an exchange of prisoners, is agreed. Zelensky has made a promising start. Uh, we have to begin all the steps publicly all the steps in Minsk process, in Normandy. I, I hope that I have, I, I just for, forgot to say about it to our journalists. Uh, we, we, I hope we'll have the nearest meeting in Normandy format and we'll speak about it and we'll speak all the steps during the, not the future, but during the nearest future. We have to do all the steps to finish this horrible war. But Zelensky hasn't bargained on the degree to which Russia has a hold on Donbass. Well, we have little information about what is going on in the occupied parts of Donbass. But what we know is that there is quite substantial brainwashing that is going on. There are uh, a myriad of images with the posters uh, referring to the Second World War, showing the local kind of leaders with children and saying how they are defending uh, this territory from, you know, vicious Ukrainian regime. Putin is also handing out passports in Donbass. It is common practice in the Russian Federation to either force people to take passports in the occupied territories or to even change the ethnic composition of the population, to colonize such enclaves with new Russians. In fact, the residents of the occupied part of the Luhansk and Donetsk regions were often just forced to obtain Russian passports. Without this, they would not be able to live normally in the territories, receive quasi-state services, confirm their identity and so on. President Zelensky is also unsure of the signals coming from Germany and France. Since 2015, and the failure to implement the Minsk agreements, the war in Ukraine, it seems, has largely been forgotten. In 2019, Berlin and Paris successfully lobby for Russia to be reinstated into the Council of Europe. It was expelled in 2014, after Crimea was annexed. 
Ich äh, war in der Frage gespalten. I was divided on the question. There was a strong argument on the part of the Russian NGOs who said you must give us access to the European Court of Human Rights. This is a great asset for us. And even if the Duma has now decided that the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights should not be implemented in Russia, for us it is of high symbolic value what decisions are made there. In Russland. Trotzdem ist es für uns von, von hohem symbolischen Wert, was für Entscheidungen dort gefällt werden. Ukraine reacts with fury. You, my dear friends, who will vote for this, will make your place, will find your place in the history. Because you will give possibility to Russia to go further. There was war in Chechnya, no sanctions in Council of Europe. There was a war in Georgia, no sanctions from Council of Europe. Finally, aggression against Ukraine, sanctions, five years and, oh, sorry, we are coming back. It shows the weakness of the West not to be able to stand firm by its um, conditionality and being not being ready to defend its values, allowing organizations and, and, and organizations and states like Russia to, in a way, erode these institutions from uh, inside, to allow this kind of double standards uh, to creep in and to weaken the power uh, of, of these institutions. Then in August, President Macron unexpectedly announces his own Russia reset policy. Le rêve de la France uh, depuis très longtemps. France's dream for a very long time has been to be the balancing power in Europe between East and West. En Europe, entre l'Est et l'Ouest. So let's say, in the context of French politics, and also the economic and politically important decisions to be made in Europe by the new President Macron, for him, Putin was an important pawn on the chessboard. Le nouveau président Macron, pour lui, Poutine était un pion important sur l'échiquier. Eastern European nations are alarmed. It seems to me that these very fears of the former Soviet republics, especially the Baltic states, are very understandable because the memory of how they were reincorporated into the USSR is still very much alive. In addition, the events in eastern Ukraine, these fears, if these fears still seemed illusory, the annexation of Crimea, these very actions in Donbass and so on, they certainly fed these fears. They became stronger. But if Ukraine has doubts about France and Germany, it can always look to the United States for support. We made every effort possible to reinforce US support for Ukraine and to make Russia's aggression against Ukraine not worth the cost in the hopes that we could convince President Putin to negotiate a solution. We lifted the previous administration's ban on providing lethal defensive equipment to Ukraine, and we actually provided uh, anti-tank missiles, which I think uh, were significant in getting the Russians to pull back a little bit from the front lines and to not take any more territory. In September 2019, President Zelensky makes his first trip to the US to give his maiden speech at the United Nations in New York. Thank you very much. Але у сучасному світі, де ми з вами живемо, більше немає чужої війни. Ніхто з вас не зможе почувати себе в безпеці, коли йде війна. Ukraine, 
But his appearance is overshadowed by his part in a scandal engulfing President Donald Trump. It hinges on a phone call between the two men two months before, in July 2019. In the call, Trump asks Ukraine to investigate claims of alleged corruption made against his Democratic rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter. Otherwise, US aid will be withheld. I want no quid pro quo. So when President Donald Trump froze $400 million in U.S. military aid to Ukraine to allegedly pressure the country's leader for a personal political favor, Ukrainians got nervous. The call from Trump was outrageous. Outrageous. And it was not just an ugly call, but it was a real and very dangerous threat to Ukraine. Namely, if I remember correctly, 400 million will not be released for military equipment, which Ukraine desperately needed. Nice to meet you. After the phone call in July, President Zelensky is put under pressure by members of Trump's inner circle to make a public statement saying Ukraine will investigate Joe Biden. Very happy that the phone call with President Trump took place. Yes. In September, reports appear in the press about Trump's demand for an investigation in exchange for aid. Under mounting pressure, Trump releases a rough transcript of his call with Zelensky. Democrats in Congress immediately call for the president's impeachment. Thank you very much, everybody. We're with the president of Ukraine, and he's made me more famous, and I've made him more famous. And, uh, I will say he's got a great On September 25th, following his appearance before the UN General Assembly, President Zelensky has his first meeting with his U.S. counterpart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. President Zelensky, have you felt any pressure from President Trump to investigate Joe, Joe Biden and Hunter Biden? I'm sorry, but I don't want to be involved to democratic, open uh, elections, elections of USA. No, you heard that we had, uh, I think, good uh, phone call. It was normal. We spoke about many things. And I, so I think and you read it that nobody pushed, it, pushed me. Yes. In other words, no pressure. But there's something else in the phone call that attracts attention. Zelensky agrees with President Trump a thousand percent that Germany and France had done almost nothing to help Ukraine. This, despite the EU's action on sanctions against Russia and provision of development aid to the country since 2014. No one can believe for a second, and certainly not the Ukrainians, that Europe, France and Germany have done nothing for Ukraine. Quite the contrary. In 2014, if the Europeans had not been there, we do not know what would have happened. We don't know how far Vladimir Putin would have gone. The frustration on the Ukrainian side is that it was treated as though both sides are equally to blame. Very seldom do you hear German or French uh, diplomats uh, explicitly make it clear it is Russia's responsibility and that Russia is the one leading the fighting in eastern Ukraine. Zelensky attempts reconciliation with EU partners. And uh, we thank, uh, thank everybody, thank uh, all of the European countries that help us. But uh, we also want to have more, more, but uh, I understand so only together, America and EU, only together we can stop the war. And, uh, you, know, you know, we are ready. Zelensky's first brush with Trump has been bruising. Ich fand eigentlich die Antwort von Zelensky eher I actually found Zelensky's answer uncomfortable because I felt sorry for him. I felt really sorry for him. 
Yes, it was not nice to actually be kowtowing and to the detriment of third parties. Extremely unsightly. But I would say the scandal came from Washington. Ich würde sagen, der Skandal kam aus Washington. Trump's impeachment now compromises Ukraine's relationship with the United States. So what happened is uh, U.S. domestic politics exploded over the effort to impeach President Trump, and Ukraine stopped being a national security concern and a foreign policy concern, and instead became a prop. Uh, it, was, it was a device for going after the president or going after the Democrats. It will take a crisis on the Ukrainian border, Putin's military maneuvers in spring 2021, to push Ukraine to the forefront of the new president, Joe Biden's, policy agenda. Only then will the US and Europe truly be forced to confront their own relationship with Russia. Are they allies for Ukraine? Or do they play into Putin's hands? And for Zelensky, can he bring peace to his country? Or will Ukraine remain a pawn in East-West politics? I'm worried. Increasing troop numbers, increasing equipment near our borders, there is real concern. Since the beginning of 2014, since the beginning of the war in Donbass, since Russia's annexation of Crimea, there has been understandable concern. And it is this, that there may be an escalation at any time. 